Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Asbestos Part 1. And we are going to be talking about as understanding asbestos from product to waste today. Uh, my name is Tara Albert, and I am the Solid Waste Operator Training Coordinator for the state of New Hampshire, and welcome to our class today. Before we get started talking about asbestos, we have a few logistics and housekeeping issues to go over with you guys. Uh, first, you do have a way to minimize this toolbar here. So if you have this toolbar on your screen, some of you do, some of you don't. If you do have it, you can minimize it by pushing this orange rectangle with the white arrow. You can also raise your hand by clicking the hand button. Let me make sure that I have turned that on for you guys. Yes, I hit it. All right, so you can raise your hand. Keep in mind that you are muted and we will not likely unmute you. However, if you do raise your hand, I will reach out to you via the chat box or the question box uh, and can answer, check in with you to see if you have any questions. Also, you do have a questions box here. So if you have a question for the, the speaker or presenter, please feel free to type that in to the questions box. Don't worry, spelling does not count. As long as I can sound it out, we're good to go. There also is a documents pane which says handouts. It should be under, it's not here um, for, because we didn't have handouts during this presentation, but um, underneath that is the documents pane. In there you will find documents that are pertinent for the training for today. Um, <clears throat> and included in that there's an asbestos fact sheet. There is a one pager that talks about the regulations uh, that we're gonna go over today. There's a summary of the requirements. There's a BMP for asbestos, and then there's also uh, the solid waste uh, asbestos rules are in there for you guys as well. So if you are on VPN um, and you're having technology issues, you're gonna wanna disconnect from VPN and then come back to the website. Remember to save and copy and paste that link so you have it on your desktop. If you do not know what a VPN is, you're probably not on it, so don't worry about it. Also. There is an audio pin if you're having issues. So I'm underlining this here. So if you cannot hear me, I'm talking and you can't hear me, use this audio pin. There is a way that you can change how you call in if you um, go to audio. And you can choose which one. And if you choose phone, then you can call in. And this is if you are having audio issues. All right, so housekeeping. I know you guys are probably in your office or you're at home, wherever it is that you are, the same rules apply. Make sure that you stay hydrated, drink your water. Um, if you are using a single use container, remember to recycle it, please. Uh, also, usually this is the place where we remind you where the restrooms are. Well, of course, we're not at DES, we're online. You can find the bathroom on your own. But the purpose of this is to let you know to feel free to get up you can move around, but make sure you do come back. Uh, I do have a ticker on my screen that will show you show me if you're not paying attention. So make sure you come back because I can see if you aren't paying attention and you don't get credit if you're not paying attention during the day. Okay, you entered today and you are muted. I do have the ability to unmute you. If for some reason I do unmute you, please make sure that you do remute yourself. I also am still obligated to remind you of your emergency exits. Um, of course, this is not my emergency exit, but it's pretty and I wanted to show it to you guys. Um, if you are, if there is an emergency, please feel free to leave the training and then you can connect back with me later on and we will figure out how to get you the whole training for the day. All right, so we are also gonna be posting a few polls throughout the day, and I'm gonna show you one of them now so that you can know exactly what it is that you're gonna see on your screen when a poll pops up. Um, and please answer the poll question. So it is how many people are participating with you under the one login? Um, and remember, if there's more than just one, you're going to need to create your verification of training. And I did email out a sign-in sheet to you guys uh, yesterday. So if you did not get that or you need another copy of it, let me know after the training and I can get that out to you. So we've got about 75% of the people voted. Let's give it a couple more seconds and see if we can get that number up a bit. All 
Oh, we've got shy people today. All right. Now I'm going to share the results just so you guys can see what it is that you're going to see. So you can see that 78% of you, it's just you. That's fine. And then for the 22% of you that there's one to two of you in the class, um, more on top of who's already there or who's already registered, make sure that you create those sign-in sheets or those verification of training so you guys can get credit for the class. All right. Now I'm going to make sure that we are back on the right view. Oh, yes. Okay. So you're probably wondering how we're going to take attendance today. Well, we do see who is registered, who has physically signed in, and then the computer will tell us who is actively listening versus who has walked away from their computer or who's shopping on Amazon. Uh, you will, we also will be submitting poll questions that we that will have a time limit. Within those polls, we see the engagement in the training. There are, if there, again, if there are multiple people in the room with you, we'll account for that. Use the sign-in sheet that I emailed to you uh, or create a sign-in sheet with the printed name of each person plus the signature. You're going to also want to include the, the date of the class, the title of the class, and a little bit of information on what you guys got out of it. And I know you're going to have conversations while we're talking about all of this. Keep some notes for yourself. You can submit those notes as verification of training. It shows me that you're engaged in what it is that we're talking about. All right, an email will go out tomorrow with a survey and an evaluation. Please remember to be truthful in your assessment of the class, and but be kind. Also remember the response is not anonymous. Uh, a few, couple more logistics, videos. We do have a couple of videos in this training. For those of you who are not watching this live, the videos will not play on the recording. You'll have to watch them. We'll add them in and you can watch them um, as a separate addendum. If you are watching live, the video should pop up on your screen um, and they will play. You will have, they do have sound. If for some reason you, um, the, the screen does not go away once the video is over, you may need to close that screen out. Some systems will open up a second, a second window we don't know why, we don't know what the rhyme or reason is. Um, you may need to close that. If you accidentally close yourself completely out of the system, that's okay. Just go back to your email, click that join link and you'll pop right back into the class. So don't stress, don't worry. Okay, we will take a quick question and answer break after each presentation. So if you wanna type those questions in or raise your hand and I can check in with you, um, you can ask those. We will still take our 15 minute break, approximately halfway through the agenda. Also, we are recording this session as well, so no pressure for you guys. All right, so why are you here? You are here to take a class, Understanding Asbestos from Product to Waste. Um, again, my name is Tara. Uh, I hope you've made a note of the slide that we're scrolling on so you can see all those evacuation procedures and things like that. Um, I'm going to highlight a few screens. Um, Sorry, had a little glitch here. Don't worry about that sentence. All right, so why are you here? There's one answer to this question is because you have to be. According to New Hampshire solid waste rules and the law, all solid waste facility operators must be certified. And to maintain your certification, you must participate in at least two and a half hours of continuing professional development each year. Coming to a workshop conducted by DES satisfies this requirement. Another answer is that you're here to build your resume or build up your number of continuing professional development hours. And we will talk a little bit more about those professional development hours at the end of the workshop. Why are we presenting on asbestos? I'm not sure if you know this, but you are employed at a job that is one of the top 10 most dangerous jobs in America, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Waste and recycling handlers are number five on the list and have about 33 deaths per 100,000 full-time employees. Deaths due, are due to accidents and exposure to hazardous materials and heavy equipment. This number might not seem like a lot, but even one death is too many, especially that could have been prevented. So we're, we're very glad that you're here today to understand more about asbestos, something that does contain hazardous materials and how to safely handle it, not only to protect yourself, but to protect the environment too. Uh, we presented this workshop twice in 2014 and again twice in 2015 to a packed house each time. Uh, we decided to post it again in 2016. We offered it again in 2018 and this is I think the first time we have 
hosted this workshop since 2018. So we hope that you enjoy it and you learn something that you did not know before today. Before we talk about the agenda and to get into this, I wanted to leave you with a little bit of humor before we get going, because the rest of it does not have any humor. Okay, so what are we gonna cover today? Uh, with us, we have myself and then also James Tilly, and I will introduce him in a second. Looking at the agenda, we are gonna be talking about the health concerns of asbestos, the history of asbestos use and production, the current uses of asbestos and the asbestos waste stream. And this is when we're gonna give you guys a break because you're gonna need it. And then after that, we're gonna talk about asbestos regulations and best management practices. We may talk about solid waste operator training between best management practices and Q&A. It depends on what time it is and if we have enough time given all of the information that we're going to be covering with you guys today. So with that, our first instructor is James and I will ask him to turn his camera on so I can introduce him. Good morning, Tara. Good morning, James. Oh, and I realized I did not add your title here. Can you tell us what your title is? I am the asbestos management supervisor here at DES. Thank you. All right, so let me introduce James and then I'm gonna pass the baton to him. Uh, for the past year, James has been James Tilly has been managing the asbestos program of the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. The DES asbestos program ensures compliance with asbestos related requirements for demolition <laughs> and asbestos abatement activities and processes, applications for licenses and certifications for asbestos abatement professionals. Prior to that position, James worked in the enforcement section of the Air Resources Division for six years, where he managed approximately 100 enforcement cases per year, including cases that involved violations of asbestos-related requirements. All right, so with that, James, I'm gonna pass the baton to you for one second. Got it. And I see what is asbestos. Oh. Great. Oh, I don't see it anymore though. Where'd it go? There it is. All right, uh, welcome everybody, good morning. Um, thank you for joining us. So what is asbestos? Asbestos is a natural occurring mineral. Uh, it is not human made. It's formed under metamorphic conditions, essentially uh, high pressure, high heat, in a water rich environment, typically in a vein formation. Asbestos minerals are fibrous and needle-like, and humans mine, mine asbestos from the ground and then process it to remove impurities. In the slide here, uh, you can see uh, different veins of the asbestos mineral and vertically there are fibers and depending on the type of asbestos, it could be more needle-like rather than uh, fiber-like. Uh, asbestos is made of magnesium, silicon, oxygen, and hydrogen. And the most common types that you may encounter are chrysotile, which is a white asbestos, amosite, which is a brown asbestos, and crocidolite, which is a uh, blue asbestos. Zooming out on that uh, image I just showed you, uh, this is what a asbestos mineral looks like. You can see the, uh, the veins in there. And then here is an image of uh, chrysotile asbestos, very fibrous, dangerous material. So historians have uh, dated the use of asbestos back to 4000 BC. The ancient Greeks uh, used it as uh, for candle wicks and for napkins. Uh, obviously for candle wicks they used it because of the slow burn associated with it. And for napkins, uh, the reason they used it there was when the napkin, napkins became dirty, to clean them, they would just throw them in the fire to clean them off. 
Asbestos, the, na the word asbestos comes from ancient Greek for the word inextinguishable. In recent times, uh, in the, after World War II, it was thought to be a magic material that was perfect for certain building materials and clothes. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, some of the great properties associated with it also cause uh, health concerns. So the, the properties uh, that make asbestos a great building material is it has a high tensile strength, it's non-conductive, it's non-combustible, it's resistant to corrosion, strong and flexible, it's lightweight, it has microscopic fibers, so you can make small materials out of it, and it's non-biodegradable. However, these last three characteristics, lightweight microscopic fibers and non-biodegradable, biodegradable also make it a dangerous material. So how small is asbestos? In this image, you can see a Lincoln penny with three, two to three grains of rice over here five to six human hairs here, and right in front of uh, President Lincoln's mouth, there's about an area that could have 20,000 asbestos fibers. And President Lincoln looks like he's about to inhale those. So what are the health concerns associated with asbestos? Uh, and it primarily has to do with this uh, these characteristics of it being lightweight, microscopic, and non-biodegradable. Uh, well, we need to think about the routes of exposure, and there are two primary routes of exposure, either inhalation, in other words, breathing it in, in, into your lungs, or through ingestion, uh, getting into your digestive system. Uh, there is some concern about asbestos in drinking water, because for decades, asbestos cement pipe was manufactured to transfer drinking water. It does not uh, dissolve in water, uh, so it's not much of a concern in groundwater. All right, this is, uh, I think, uh, Daffy Duck with a smoke around him. Uh, it's supposed to represent asbestos. Inhaling fibers can cause serious health effects. Fibers can be deposited with the lungs, and because it's not biodegradable, asbestos fibers and the needle-like structures can essentially stay in your lungs uh, forever. It, it doesn't uh, break down in your lungs. They just get embedded into the alveoli of your lungs and, and stay there permanently. It's considered a hazardous air pollutant by EPA, and so EPA has developed national emission standards for this particular hazardous air pollutant. So Tara, I've got a poll question for the folks. Do you yep. think you may have been exposed to asbestos? That poll has been launched. Ooh, you guys are voting quick. All right, James, they're at 93% already at 20 seconds. That's very quick. I'm gonna get, see if we can get that 100%. All right, so I'm gonna close and share. So 33, 31% said yes, absolutely. 8% said no, and then 62% no, I don't think so. so okay. James, what are we thinking? Uh, well, uh, that's probably right. Um, although I have heard a scientist say that every human on the planet has asbestos and asbestos fiber uh, in their lungs. Uh, I'm not sure where he's getting that, but it's pretty ubiquitous uh, mineral. Uh, and used just about everywhere. And so it's likely that everybody has had at least a little bit of an exposure. I certainly has, uh, think that I've been exposed. I used to work in the uh, construction business on uh, HVAC systems.
for a few years. I used to go in a lot of attics and work uh, dampers on those HVAC systems that used to drill holes and duct work and uh, balance water systems that had uh, pipes with insulation all over them. I didn't think of asbestos back back in my early 20s when I was doing that. So I'm pretty confident that I've been exposed to asbestos. And uh, and uh, hope, hope I make it uh, <laughs> without any sort of asbestos related disease. All right, moving on here. Uh, I want to talk about first and second hand exposure. This is uh, Pigpen here. He's ha he's the uh, first hand exposure. He was uh, doing something uh, with asbestos to get exposed. And then poor Charlie Brown here uh, shows up in the room after uh, Pigpen was there and gets a second hand exposure. So basically, uh, you as a uh, solid waste operator, could be get a first-hand exposure when you're uh, handling materials that contain asbestos. Uh, you you get that asbestos material, uh, dust or fibers, on your clothes, and then you interact with your coworkers or your family and friends, and then they experience a second-hand exposure. And uh, the second-hand exposures can be uh, a risk. There are three general types of diseases uh, that can result from asbestos fiber exposure. Uh, it, and these include uh, lung cancer, which is a malignant tumor that invades and obstructs the lungs and air passages. Meso Thelioma, which is another type of uh, asbestos-based cancer that affects the lining of the lungs or the abdominal cavity. And asbestosis, which is not a cancer. Uh, it's just a buildup of asbestos fibers uh, in your lungs and cause irritation, inflammation, and scarring of the lung tissue. Studies show that there's about a 10 to 40 year latency period before someone who has had an exposure to asbestos will experience symptoms. And uh, it varies from person to person. Uh, somebody could have the same exposure as somebody else for the same period of time, but because somebody's body reacts differently, uh, that person may not uh, get the disease uh, while the other person does. So the asbestos fibers enter the airway through uh, the mouth or nose and go down through the trachea and into the, uh, the lung and embed themselves in the alveoli here. So I just wanted to show you some uh, uh, images of these diseases. Here you can see lung tissue with asbestosis. Here's an Im image of lung cancer cells. And here's an image of mesothelioma lung cancer cells. Uh, I don't want to get into the health effects too much because uh, I'm not a doctor, but we do have a, uh, a nice video on the health effects. Okay. So Tara, could you uh, play that video? And then yep. we have another video after that uh, from John's Mansville, a production video. Yep, hang on one second and I will grab those. Okay. And for those of you who are watching the recording, please remember that you will have to watch the videos separately. Uh, they will not play through the recording. All right. All right, there are um, five factors that determine the risk for developing an asbestos-related disease. The dose, which is essentially how big of a gulp of asbestos fibers did you uh, take either through your lungs or through your digestive system the duration of your exposure, 
Is it hours, days, years? How The frequency, how often you've been exposed, the occupation you have, uh, the insula if you're an insulation worker, uh, back when they were using uh, asbestos for insulation, uh, if you work in shipyards, is a higher risk, firefighters, or if you're in manufacturing. Also, smoking status uh, has a huge impact on whether or not you would, your chances of developing a disease. Uh, someone who smokes has a 50 to 90 times greater chance of developing a disease than non-smokers. Um, so depending on uh, what risk factor you uh, might experience, uh, you're essentially rolling the dice uh, on these different exposures. And Tara, uh, could you play the video of the patient who had secondhand exposure? Absolutely. All right, and uh, really, I just want to know if anybody has any questions. All right, let's see. So anybody want to raise their hand? You can feel free to raise your hand. If you need a second to uh, take in what you just watched, <laughs> I understand that. Um, or if you have want to chat or ask questions. I am not seeing any hands raised. All right, James, I think you did your work. I'm sure um, this one's a tough one. This this presentation that I remember the first time I saw it and it just kind of hit me like, holy cow. Um, so as, you go, as we go through this, guys, if you've got any questions, please feel free to ask them. All right, James, I'm gonna go ahead and take the, the screen back from you and go on to the next presentation. We'll see you in a little bit. All right, guys, make sure you're seeing what you're supposed to, yes. Okay, so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the history of asbestos. Do any of you recognize this picture? It's from the movie, The Time Machine, which was produced in 1960. It stars Rod Taylor as a turn of the century inventor whose time machine, the contraption shown in the picture inadvertently transports him thousands of years into the future. I won't give away the plot, but if you're into old movies, you should watch this one. Today, rather than going thousands of years into the future, I want to take you a thousands of years back in time to take a look at the history of asbestos use worldwide. So let's take a trip back to the future. As you now know, asbestos has many properties that make it an extraordinarily useful to human society. As James told you, asbestos is very durable, has the tensile strength equivalent to a piano wire. It is non-conductive and resists corrosion. It is lightweight and because it's a mineral, it is non-biodegradable. It also is non-combustible. So when I first heard all of those things, I thought, well, okay, but when someone disposes of it, what happens to it? So I'm gonna leave you guys with a question here. I want you to think about it. The poll question, what is asbestos when you dispose of it? I know it's a weird place to have this exact question, but I want you guys to think about it. So the answer is either a solid waste or a hazardous waste, which one? And I'm not gonna give you the answer just yet. Very mixed views. Give you guys a couple more seconds. Let me get that number up a little bit. All right, with this one, you were allowed to choose whatever you wanted to. So 36% said a solid waste, 91% said a hazardous waste, and many of you said both. It cannot be both. It has to be one or the other. 
kind of a trick question. All right, so think about that while we go through all of these things about asbestos and what it is. So the word asbestos comes from the Greek word meaning indistinguishable or indestructible. However, it has been known by many other names, including mountain leather, incombustible linen, and rock floss. Uh, the name of chrysotile, one of the most common forms of asbestos, is derived from the Greek word chrysos, gold, and tylos, fiber, or gold fiber. Man's use of asbestos, it predates written history. It can be traced back to the end of the Stone Age, so rush, roughly 4,000 to 6,000 years ago. We know from archaeological digs that it was being used to chink or seal log homes in Scandinavia and in making property, pottery in Finland, Russia, Norway, and Sweden. You may be asking yourself why. Why did they do this? Remember, it is due to the high tensile strength, high strength of this material. The picture on the slide, it's of an early piece of pottery made by hunter-gatherers in the Finland-Norway region. It's known as combware because of the decorative imprints on the surface. The Egyptians, they made clothing with asbestos. They embalmed their pharaohs with asbestos. Lovely. And similarly, the Persians imported asbestos from India for wrapping their dead. They thought it was from, it was hair from a small animal that lived by fire and died by water. In early Greek and Roman times, it was used for flame retardant cloth, lamp wicks, building materials, and women's clothing. Uh, at rest in restaurants in the Roman times, they would take the tablecloths that were made um, with asbestos and these tablecloths were flame retardant. So they would, after the people got up to leave from the table, they would throw the entire tablecloth into the fire and that would remove the food and other debris, and then they would place it right back on the table for the next customer. During this time in history, uh, a, a historian named Pliny the Elder noted uh, that early death among quarry slaves and other asbestos workers. So he described the use of goat or lamb bladder membranes that the slave miners as a type of early respirator, he wanted them to use them. Uh, nonetheless, People were warned not to buy quarry slaves because they would look, likely die young. Then with the collapse of the Roman Empire came the Middle Ages or the medieval period, which continued until the Renaissance period. So around the 15th century, 1400s. In the medieval times, asbestos was used extensively as insulation in suits of armor. And when you had unscrupulous merchants, they made they would make it into crosses that they advertised have, having been made from the true cross. Some of the forms of asbestos, they look like old wood and merchants claim that their resistance to fire was proof that these wooden crosses came from the cross on which Christ was hung. Also during the middle ages, Knights of the First Crusade are believed to have used asbestos bags to hurl flaming pitch and tar at the enemy using catapults. In that same relative time frame, so we went from 10, 1025 to 1280, uh, during the epic journey across the Asian continent to China and back, the Venetian merchant Marco Polo, he encountered clothing which would not burn in Mongolia. So these are images of those um, clothing in museums today. A couple of other trivia that come out of this is Italy made asbestos paper in the 1700s and by 1800 it was being used to produce banknotes. A purse was made of fireproof asbestos. It's now part of the London's Natural History Museum collection. It was brought to England by Benjamin Franklin during his first visit there in 1725. And then a Parisian fire brigade in the mid 1850s wore jackets and helmets made from asbestos. So firemen have been using asbestos clothing since at least the 1850s. Now, we know that mining began over 4,000 years ago. The first documented quarry was being worked during the first century AD. It was on a Greek island. 
Here in North America, the first commercial mine began operation in 1879 in Thetford, Canada. And if you know where that is, you know it's right over the Canadian border, right, right from here. As the Industrial Revolution of the late 1800s gained momentum, asbestos mining increased with the demand for the product. So mining became worldwide endeavor, with mines being found in the United States, Russia, China, India, Brazil, and South Africa. That's just to name a few places where it was found. And just a short distance from New Hampshire, asbestos mining played a big role in meeting the demand for asbestos during the 1900s. So we are now in the, in the 1900s, which would be the 20th century. In 1899, asbestos was found at Belvedere Mountain in central northern Vermont, not far from the Canadian border. It discover, its discovery contributed to the rapid rise in asbestos use. By 1960, that mine was producing 3,500 tons per day of asbestos. This mine did close in 1993. And we're going to talk a little bit about why it closed. Okay, before we talk about why it closed, let's look at how much asbestos has been used since commercial mining began in 1879 at the Thetford's Mines in Canada. During the first year of operation, the Thetford mine produced 300 tons of asbestos. I told you that already. So 300 tons in year one. 30 years, well, 40 years later, the demand for asbestos had ridden, risen over to 500,000 tons a year. It peaked in the 1970s at 4 million tons a year, but then dropped off dramatically in 1980s due to right new regulations and concerns about the health impacts of asbestos exposure. So in the 70s, we went from 4 million tons per year of production, and then 10 years later, it dropped off. So even so, that's a lot of asbestos being used in our buildings, equipment, and everyday products from 1879 to 1980s a lot of asbestos. By the end of the Industrial Revolution, over 3,000 different asbestos products, asbestos containing products were being produced, including textile products, so fire gloves, aprons, friction devices, clutches, brake pads, paper products, gaskets, pipe wrap. You've got insulation, the, the pipes in the building, building construction, so siding and roofing, road construction. So in pavement, it also was a concrete additive, and then it was also found in piping. Once the U.S. started producing asbestos, it became a major component of insulation for boilers, fireboxes, and pipes. They were all in steam locomotives. Boxcars and cabooses, refrigeration units, and steam water lines were all insulated with asbestos. It was found everywhere. Train boxes and clutches were lined with asbestos. And then even when the industry switched to diesel, many of the new trains still used asbestos. <clears throat> During World War II, asbestos was commonly used in ships. There were 4.3 million pipe fitters, insulators, and other shipyard workers at that time. So 4.3 million people. Their death toll due to mesothelioma was 14 per 1,000, and that was just for the shipyard workers. The number who suffered and died from asbestosis is still unknown. Before World War II, in 1939, Hollywood produced the well-known movie, The Wizard of Oz, and they used an asbestos product. I'm gonna show you a clip and let me, I want you to tell me what you think that um, asbestos product was. There's no sound to this clip, um, but you should be able to hear it. Oh. Um, uh oh, maybe I won't be able to play it. Let me see, hold on. Oh, there we go.
All right. What do you guys think they that was they were using asbestos for in this clip? And type it in to the question box. Oh, there we go. Snow. Yes. The snow that they were using was asbestos. Just friable asbestos. Production companies tried many different materials for snow, but asbestos looked the best. It was highly favorable. Now, think about that they were freely using it in movies. What else were they using in it using it in? Um, and this was in 1939. So people were just now starting to realize the dangers of asbestos. All right. So let's bring this, this a little bit closer to home. There were three asbestos product manufacturers in New Hampshire. In Meredith, the Amatex company made asbestos cloth until 1982. They disposed of their asbestos waste at the town dump. In Tilton, the Quinn T Corporation made asbestos paper products until 1980. They disposed of their asbestos waste in landfills on the same property as the plant. Now this third company. In Nashua, the Johns Manville Corporation manufactured asbestos transite board. This plant shut its doors in 1985. The Johns Manville Corporation made a practice of giving asbestos waste to asbestos waste to area property owners for use as clean fill. Clean fill. That's right. For over 70 years, Johns Manville delivered asbestos waste to property owners in Nashua and Hudson. As a result, we believe that there's over 400,000 tons of asbestos waste dumped throughout those communities, affecting over 300 residential, commercial, industrial, institutional, and public properties. Those properties are mapped through our asbestos disposal program, and we are working with those um, with those people that own those properties now. If you happen to excavate any of these properties, this is what you might find. So let me see if I can point these things out to you. All right, so here you see this red coloring here. That is bag house waste. This black here is also bag house waste. And then there's some bag house waste down here. And then if you look over here, this is plate scrap waste. This is all asbestos. And as you can see, they did not have to dig deep to find this. People were using this as clean fill. So think about the when you drive down the road and you see people asking for a clean fill, they were getting asbestos waste as clean fill. This picture was taken on a residential property where the owner hoped to place a utility line. This is on the surface. He dug, and this is what he found. And look how deep it is. This is both plate scrap and bag house waste. So there's bag house waste over here. And then all these things that look like sheer plates, they're plates, it's plate waste. Asbestos was also used for a number of years in bridge construction. Asbestos containing materials and bridges include the membranes between the decking and the pavement, the pavement itself and the bridge shoes and back walls of the bridge. So basically everywhere. New Hampshire Department of Transportation estimates there's 400 to 800 state owned bridges with asbestos. We do not know how many town owned bridges might be affected. This is important for you guys to know because some of you who also work for your town DPW do bridge maintenance work. Also bridge waste might show up at your solid waste facility. During the many centuries of asbestos use, the people who worked with it were getting sick. I told you earlier that in the first century AD, Pliny the Elder noticed that asbestos workers were prone to getting sick and dying. He's the guy who said, don't buy quarry slaves. He's also the guy that suggested the use of a respirator made of transparent bladder skin to protect workers from the dust. But quarry slaves didn't have laws to protect them. Those laws could not, would not come into effect for a very long time even though people knew asbestos exposure could be deadly. 
1899, a doctor noted what he called curious bodies in the lungs of a deceased asbestos worker. Do you remember that first video that we showed with the pleura and how you, they, it showed the inside of the lungs and how those little needle-like structures were getting stuck? Well, in 1899, a doctor noted those. A few years later in 1906, that was the first autopsy documenting an asbestos-related death. So 1906. And what year did the plants close in New Hampshire? 1980, so 80 years later. It was getting harder and harder for people to deny what was happening. In 1918, life insurance companies began decreasing coverage for asbestos workers. So between 1906 and 1918, that's when the life insurance companies started digging in. So in 1924, Nellie Kershaw died. Important name to remember, Nellie Kershaw. She had been employed in Manchester, England from 1917, spinning raw asbestos fiber into yarn. There was an inquest following her death. The pathologist, Dr. Edmund Cook, who examined her body, testified that his examination of the lungs indicated old scarring, indicative of previous healed tuberculosis infection, and extensive fibrosis, which were visible in particles of mineral matter of various shapes, but the large majority have sharp angles. He concluded that they originated from asbestos and were without a doubt the cause of the fibrosis of the lungs and Nellie's death. This was the first diagnosis of an asbestosis in the United Kingdom. This was in 1924. A few years later, in 1930, Dr. Cook reported that 66% of asbestos workers with 20 years of experience were sick from asbestosis. Let me say that again. In 1930, Dr. Cook reported that 66% of asbestos workers with 20 years of experience were sick from asbestosis, 66%. Finally, in 1931, a law was passed requiring ventilation in the workplace for asbestos workers. There is ample proof that 20th century manufacturers knew asbestos was harming their workers, but they chose to conceal that information from workers and others. Thousands would needlessly die as a result. In the 1970s, the United States Environmental Protection Agency began to regulate asbestos, which eventually reduced, but has not entirely eliminated asbestos products in our daily lives. So later today, we are gonna take a closer look at all of those regulations, but now you have a history of it. So we are back to the present. Does anyone have any questions or comments? If you do, you feel free to raise your hand and or type in your questions. Either way is fine. I know it's a lot of information that we've given you guys in this hour. No questions, concerns? No hands raised? Have we scared you all to death? All right. So Next presenter is James is going to hop back on. James, are you here? You can turn your camera on. I am here. Hello. All right, let me know when you're ready for me to pass the baton. <clears throat> I am ready. Cool. All right, you got it. And I have your slide. All right, great. Um, so I'm going to talk about some current, uh, some asbestos containing material that's of concern currently. Um, and before I get into that, I want to let you know that in New Hampshire and with the EPA, asbestos containing material is considered asbestos containing when it has more than 1% uh, asbestos as determined by polarized light microscopy. And uh, the only way to determine if a material has asbestos is through microscopic analysis. If you are in doubt of any material that, that comes to your facility that might contain asbestos, um, don't, don't, do not accept it. All right, so uh, vinyl flooring uh, in the form of tiles or sheeting can contain asbestos, 
as well as the backing and mastics that hold that uh, flooring into place. Boiler pipe insulation and cements can contain asbestos, transite siding, roofing and pipe, asphaltic roofing materials, high temperature gaskets, caulking and putty, joint compounds, friction devices such as uh, brake pads, and vermiculite, a type of insulation that was used uh, quite a bit for insulation in attics. So there are two basic types of asbestos containing material when we talk about the hazards associated with them. The first type is friable asbestos containing material. And that is material that can be crumbled or pulverized under hand pressure. Kind of like uh, you'd be able to crush it kind of like you would a cookie. The next type is cannot be crumbled or pulverized under hand pressure. And that is called non-friable asbestos containing material. This uh, type of material usually has the, has the asbestos bound up in, in the material itself. However, non-friable material can still be dangerous and become friable over time or how you treat it. For example, if a material is exposed to sunlight for several decades, it could become deteriorated and become friable. Or if you subject it to sanding, grinding, sawing, or braiding, it, it also can become dangerous. Uh, and so when people throw asbestos containing siding in the back of their truck and it explodes into a lot of pieces, that is essentially making that material friable asbestos containing material. Friable asbestos material poses the greatest uh, health uh, risk to, he to health. Um, it, in, in, in the non-friable, as I mentioned, it doesn't necessarily get released until it's improperly managed. So Tara, uh, I'd like you to play a video of asbestos containing building materials, please. Okay, hang on one second. Let me get that up for you. All right, and um, we're actually going to go into Tara a quick poll question. Okay. It is launched. Do you think asbestos containing products are still sold today in the United States? You're voting quick. All right, so I'm going to close and share that one. 100% said yes. All right, James. All right. Am I sharing my screen, Tara? Yes. Yeah. Yes, you are. Okay. Um, so I'm glad uh, we had 100% on that um, because that is correct. You can go to uh, a Lowe's or Home Depot and find asbestos-containing materials. Still, uh, there's a lot of folks that think that asbestos was banned in the the late 80s or early 90s, and that is true. Uh, back on July 12, 1989, EPA issued a rule banning nearly all asbestos-containing products. However, back in, in 1991, the regulation was overturned by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the result was that only a handful of asbestos-containing products were banned. Um, in April of 2019, EPA did issue a final rule to ensure that 
asbestos products that are no longer on the market cannot return to the market without EPA evaluating them and putting them in place necessary restrictions. Uh, but because there's not a ban on importing asbestos containing material, uh, we, we still import uh, roofing materials, flooring materials uh, that contain asbestos and uh, brake pads can still have it. And, uh, and so it's still be, being put on new structures today. Uh, be vigilant when you go to a store and read the label, it could say asbestos on it, or it could contain one of the following other names for the, the various minerals of asbestos, the chrysotile, the amosite, the crocidolite, tremolite, act, actinolite, and the antophyllite. Asbestos uh, hasn't been mined in the United States since 2002, uh, but from 2013 to 2016, the U.S. imported more than 1,000 tons of asbestos-containing material annually. Uh, some of the industries that manufacture asbestos uh, make products such as cement corrugated sheets, cement flat sheets, cement pipe, pipeline wrap, vinyl floor tiles, automatic transmission components, clutch facings, disc brake pads, drum brake linings, gaskets, roof coatings, roofing felt, and uh, certain fireproof clothing. So I'm going to go through some asbestos-containing material again and talk about whether or not they're friable or non-friable. This is a typical vinyl floor that could contain asbestos. Typically, these tiles would be nine inch by nine inch. Uh, and you probably recognize these types of tiles if you think back to uh, when you were back in middle school and high school, they were used prevalently in, the, in those types of uh, public buildings. Again, this is a vinyl floor tile that is non-friable. However, if you drill into it or start uh, removing it, chopping at it, sawing at it, it can become hazardous. Here's an old ceiling tile that is friable, contains asbestos. This is a dangerous ceiling tile. And then transite. So Transite uh, originated as a brand that the Johns Manville Company, uh, and it was created in 1929 for a line, line of asbestos cement products, including boards and pipes. In time, it became a generic term for similar asbestos cement pipe products uh, and uh, for, for cement boards typically used in wall con construction and then also for insulation, siding, roof gutters, and cement wall board. Here you can see an image of uh, some uh, pipe insulation, transite pipe insulation. Here's an image of siding that you regularly see on houses. Uh, I have a couple houses in my neighborhood that still have this siding on it. It, uh, it probably was installed in the uh, the seventies, and it is so durable that you see it uh, in neighborhoods wherever you go. It has this wavy uh, pattern to it. Here's some more asbestos containing siding, transite siding, and here's that uh, corrugated board that I discussed. Here's some transite roofing tiles that still exist here in New Hampshire. We see those every once in a while. And here is some asbestos cement pipe. And this type of pipe was used in New Hampshire to convey various public services, 
including drinking water and wastewater. Uh, there are companies in New Hampshire working to replace this type of pipe right now. Here's an image of some roofing materials. Uh, you have the asphaltic shingles, which are damaged and deteriorated, which could pose a risk. The asbestos plastic roof cement that might have been used. Uh, asbestos can be in the flashing or caulking on roofs. We've seen that uh, recently. And here is another image of that uh, vermiculite insulation that can be uh, in the attics of buildings. Here's an image of a, a furnace that is insulated with asbestos material. That insulation can be this chrysotile fibrous material. You can see the pink box here in the corner, and that's a zoom in right there. You can see how fibrous that is. Here's uh, uh, part of a pipe for a furnace and an asbestos containing gasket. And here's an image of asbestos furnace cement. Uh, here is some air cell insulation. Uh, this air cell was first produced by a company called Armstrong Contracting and Supply Corporation. Uh, basically, it's asbestos material on the, uh, the flatter uh, layers here and the air cell uh, components in there. Great insulation material, but friable and quite hazardous. In this image, uh, this boiler room was abated at some point and had the asbestos containing uh, friable material removed. However, there's some uh, mudded elbows with asbestos left over. And this is uh, actually fiberglass insulation. Here is an image of some more uh, pipe insulation, chrysotile. Um, if you look closely here, you can see little bits of that material. This is uh, what's hazardous. This is the type of stuff that an air current could just come through, lift that stuff up, and someone could breathe that very easily. Here we have some automotive products that contain asbestos. We have some gaskets. Uh, and again, automotive products can include uh, drum brakes, transmission plates, clutch facings, and lining. Okay, asbestos in the waste stream. And this is the type of thing that you should be thinking about as a solid waste operator. You have a demolition of a structure. And if that structure, in this case, it probably was a house, contained asbestos containing material and it wasn't removed prior to demolition, then all that material is mixed up in that demolition debris pile. So for example, if that debris pile uh, before it was demolished was a house that contained asbestos containing transite material, this transite uh, is deteriorated. You can see down here, it's crumbled. It's, it's uh, been uh, rendered into small pieces. And then it's been mixed up in a debris pile here. And so unless an asbestos inspector can come in and segregate out the asbestos containing material from the non asbestos containing material, then that whole debris pile is considered asbestos containing material. So, again, why should you be concerned? Because this items that could be coming into your facility could be a risk to you, your coworkers, and your family and friends. I'm going to go through some images that you might see during your work. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you have a, a conveyor belt like this, but uh, if uh, asbestos containing material comes in, uh, it looks like there could be some wallboard in there that could contain asbestos. 
and then it, it getting jostled around, uh, knocked around, could pose a hazard. In this image, it looks like uh, somebody dropped off some suspect demolition debris, and the operator took quick action to cover that with a polyethylene sheeting here and then also put maybe some bark mulch or soil on top of it to make sure that sheeting uh, doesn't get carried away with the wind. Um, and then put up some uh, signs designated this area, designating this area as a, as a hazardous area. So this is the type of stuff, actions uh, you should take if you receive or, or if somebody dumps off suspect material uh, it should be covered. Uh, if it is friable in nature, it should be wetted and maintained wet and then covered. And then there should be a barricade or signage to prevent uh, access to the pile until an abatement contractor can come and properly package and dispose of that waste. In this image, uh, I see some wall board over here that could contain asbestos. And I also see some uh, felt or asphaltic roofing materials that could also contain asbestos. So I'm gonna to touch a bit on the, uh, the regulations in New Hampshire, which are also federal regulations. In New Hampshire and throughout the country, if someone is doing a demolition or renovation project, there's a requirement to provide for an asbestos inspector to do an inspection for the presence of asbestos on the affected portions of the structure. If asbestos abatement is needed, and asbestos abatement involves the more dangerous type of asbestos, either that friable asbestos can, containing material or the non-friable that will become dangerous. Um, either it's damaged or deteriorated, or it, it's gonna be sawed like this gentleman is doing right here. Then you're supposed to notify the state that you're conducting an asbestos abatement uh, activity. And normally that is done by an asbestos abatement contractor uh, but it can also be submitted by the owner of the project. Uh, in addition, a requirement in New Hampshire, if there is a demolition, there's required to be a, a notification to the state, regardless of whether or not asbestos-containing material is involved. We only receive about 1,800 notifications per year. Uh, so despite our, our best efforts, um, the uh, not a lot of people know about these requirements and uh, back in 2013 we did a a, a brief study on, on three towns and discovered that one town issued 12 projects uh, permits for 12 projects uh, and processed 70 tons of C and D debris and DES received zero notifications from that town. Another town issued 51 permits and processed 540 tons of construction and demolition debris. And DES did not receive any notifications from that town during that year. And then in a third town, uh, they issued 80, 87 uh, permits. Uh, they didn't have a, a value for the amount of CND process. And we only received one notification from that town. So DES uh, does do outreach. Uh, we have a small staff uh, to do the asbestos related work. And we did in fact try to get the, uh, the towns to be required to notify uh, residents of asbestos related requirements through the legislature, uh, but that did not um, come up or vote. That We couldn't get that to uh, get through the legislature. So, uh, uh, as, a, as an operator, you should be on guard for asbestos-containing material that might enter your facility. And here are some helpful questions that you can ask. 
where did the waste material come from? Uh, if it came from an attic somewhere and it looks like there's insulation, like vermiculite, uh, that might be uh, uh, a consideration when, when you think it could contain asbestos containing material. How old was the building from which the waste came from? Uh, as uh, the narrator mentioned in the video, if the house was constructed or the structure was constructed prior to 1980, it is much more likely to contain asbestos containing material. Was an asbestos inspection or survey completed before beginning the demolition or renovation project? If so, there should be documentation associated with that. And then if a, an inspection was conducted, was the asbestos properly removed and disposed of before bringing the waste to the transfer station? If you have concerns about materials that enter your facility, don't accept the waste if that is an option. You can hand out DES's asbestos brochure, and I meant to bring one to show you what one looks like, uh, but it is available on our website, and you can contact DES to request brochures to hand out to uh, individuals that come to your facility. And then you can also direct them to contact DES for assistance. I'm going to go through a few more images here of some situations that you might see. This is an image of a truck carrying some what looks like uh, materials from a basement of a house. There's some pipes in here that have insulation on them, which could be asbestos containing. And there's a water heater here that could have asbestos containing insulation on the inside of the water heater, as well as gaskets associated with a fixture attached to this water heater. Here's an image of a container that contains uh, what looks like roofing materials, felts and, and shingles. This can contain asbestos, it can contain that one more than 1% asbestos. And then this image contains wallboard that could contain asbestos and insulation. Uh, in addition, uh, although it's it's a little more rare, bricks that were manufactured prior to 1980 and cinder blocks manufactured prior to 1980 could contain asbestos. It was used to make uh, those materials uh, more durable. Uh, and here's another image down here. I know it's small. Uh, the main thing I saw here was wallboard uh, that could contain asbestos. And then finally, there are situations that we've encountered where the town is left with a container full of suspect material, and then it's later discovered that it is asbestos containing material that needs to be properly disposed of. Uh, and Tara, I'd like to do a quick poll question on how much uh, folks in the audience think, think that it would cost to uh, address containers like this that uh, is full of asbestos containing material to All right. dispose of it and uh, decontaminate the containers? Okay. I am launching the poll now. So, how much does it cost to remove a container full of asbestos contaminated waste from a solid waste facility? And I guess this could be from any facility, not just a solid waste facility. But what do you guys think? Ooh, they're all over the place. Give you guys a few more seconds. All right. James, I am going to close out the poll. And what we got was 8% said $2,000, 69 cents, 
8% said around 10,000 and 23% said 2,000 or more. All right, so we've got your screen up, your camera's back on. Okay, well, what we actually have here is uh, less than 1,000, 10,000 plus or minus or greater than 20,000. And the most likely and what actually happened in, in a particular situation is that it cost over $20,000 to the town to deal with this uh, asbestos related problem. Uh, this is very expensive and uh, it has actually become more expensive in the past few months because of trucking shortages. Uh, there's a trucking shortage in the state and in the nation in general. There's also disposal shortages. So I've been hearing from abatement contractors that their costs are going up even more, um, sometimes uh, double if they have to transport the material to uh, Ohio or upstate New York. So with that, uh, I'd, I'd like to open the uh, floor for any questions that folks may have. You do, we do have one, I don't know if it's a question or a clarification while other people are typing in what they need. Um, so once a C&D pile at a transfer station has asbestos in it, um, what, what, can you give us the 30,000 foot view of that procedure? Do, do they pull it out or do they cover it? Um, there was a question that, that it can't be removed. It has to all go as, as asbestos somewhere else. Yeah, so um, it must be treated if it is unknown, uh, but it has the form function of something that could contain asbestos waste then it must be treated as asbestos waste unless an asbestos inspector comes in and determines that it's not asbestos waste. Mm -hmm. If it, until that time, then it needs to be considered asbestos waste. If it looks friable, then it should be wetted uh, and then uh, it should be covered and it should access should be restricted and it should be labeled as a hazardous area. Uh, and then what is required is that trained professionals come and remove that, and they must be trained in accordance with the asbestos rules. And so basically, uh, the best way to get those type of people, and maybe the only way, is to get an asbestos abatement contractor out there to deal with that, a licensed contractor. So the state uh, DES licenses about 80 contractors a year. Um, and we have a list of those contractors on our website. And those are the folks that you would want to contact to uh, have them come in and, and deal with the asbestos waste. Okay. Um, so the picture, the picture that was shown, and, I, and, and this, this might be where part of that confusion is. You can leave your camera on. The picture that was shown um, had that separate pile with the tarp over it. In that picture, that waste was dumped separate from the pile. Nobody went in and pulled it out of the pile. It was dumped separately and the operator said, whoa, wait a minute, I know that's asbestos. Rather than moving it into the big pile, he left it alone, covered it, wetted it, and cordoned it off. No one should be going into the CND pile and start pulling out what they think might be asbestos. You need to just back away, cordon it off, cover it off, call somebody who's actually a contractor who knows what they're supposed what they're doing yes that's that 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 is correct um okay. and uh these contractors will uh the asbestos inspector often the contractors will also be asbestos inspectors um and what they'll do is they'll come in if they see something that is suspect and they want to try to segregate it uh they will likely put on personal pr protective equipment uh like a uh, respirator uh, glasses, Tyvek soup, gloves, and then they would they would segregate it and treat it appropriately, um, and and they would be responsible for for segregating or, or clearing the pile. Uh, often they're not able to segregate it, and basically the whole pile has to be treated as asbestos-containing material. 
Um, okay, and then we had another question. Um, an attendee would like us to clarify the when DES needs to be notified of a demo job. Is it anytime there's a demolition or regardless of asbestos or not, or is it we need to be notified if there's a thought that there's asbestos? What's can you go over that notification again? Yes. So the actual requirement is the state uh, should be or notified 10 working days prior to a, any demolition. Um, and uh, uh, that is whether or not asbestos in, is involved or not. So if, if somebody is going to go demolish, d demolish a house, then the first step is to provide for an asbestos inspector to do an inspection of that house. If asbestos containing material is discovered, then uh, the asbestos material should be removed. <coughs> uh, if it is uh, the friable kind or will become essentially dangerous, if it's non friable but will become dangerous when it was being removed, then an asbestos abatement contractor would need to re remove it. Um, and then uh, a demolition notification should be submitted. There is no fee for a demolition notification, uh, but that is a requirement of the state prior to demolishing a, a uh, structure. Okie dokie. All right. Um, does anybody else have any questions for James? All right. I'm not seeing any hands or questions. Okay. So it is 10. 40 right now we are going to take a 15 minute break um people have requested a full 15 minutes so i'm giving it to you so at 10 55 meet right back here and you guys are going to learn all about um asbestos regulations and james i'm going to take that screen from you all right and i am muting but i will be here so if you guys have questions feel free to ask them All right, welcome back everybody from the break. Uh, we are going to talk about asbestos regulations, but before that we did have a question that came up through on the break. And I have asked James to hop back on and to kind of maybe give us his thought on this one. Um, we had a question about what about a stove pipe that has a layer of insulation, whether it's a pellet or worn, worn wood burn stove does is that asbestos so it could be uh really the only way to know is again through that microscopic analysis um the only way to definitively know unless an asbestos inspector uh with his or her experience can identify it as as being asbestos containing or non asbestos containing material uh, so th those asbestos inspectors go through uh, a 30, I think it's a 32 hour uh, training course, it's a four day course. Uh, so it's quite involved uh, and uh, they're required to uh, refresh every year. Uh, so they they would, would be really the only people that could tell you. If, if they didn't know, they would take the sample and send it away for analysis. Okay. Is there a... a I don't want to catch you in a hole. So if there's not an answer here, just say there's not an answer. Is there a year where those stove pipes would have asbestos and not have asbestos? Like, is that something you can buy today that has asbestos in it from like a big box store? So I don't think you can buy an insulated stove pipe today with asbestos uh, on the actual, for insulation purposes. Um, those were one of the the uh, handful of items that were banned. The insulation was banned because it's friable and very dangerous. Uh, and so I don't think that is the type of material that you can buy. What, what you can still buy are the uh, like the roofing materials, the glues, the uh, the flooring materials, uh, and those are typically manufactured either in Africa or in China, and then they're imported. Um, to the United States, but okay. but 
it's my understanding that the friable stuff is, is essentially uh, gone from from the market. It's the okay. uh, the non friable stuff that you can still readily purchase. Okay. Thank you. That was the last question that we had that was in our queue. So thank you, James, for hopping back on. I think we're good for now, but if I get another one, I know you're there. <laughs> I can ask you. All right, guys. So let's get rolling and talk about uh, asbestos regulations. So I understand rules and regulations are rarely easy, but during this presentation, I'm going to do my best to explain the regulations and how they came to be. Before we do that, yep, I've got a poll. I want to throw this out to you guys. At your facility, are you authorized to accept asbestos waste? And I want you to answer honestly. Nobody's gonna go to solid waste jail, um, but we're asking these questions purposefully. Give you a few more seconds. All right. So let me share that. So with that question, 83% of you said no, and 17% said, I don't know. Now, the, uh, those of you that are I don't knows, it'll say that on your permit, whether you're authorized or not. I will tell you, most solid waste facilities are not authorized to accept asbestos waste. Um, it is one of those prohibited wastes where you cannot um, take it into your facility. And we'll talk about that a little bit today. And I do see I've got a question in here somewhere. Ah. So what facilities in New Hampshire do accept asbestos containing material? We will answer that question in this presentation. And if I'm not clear, you ask me again at the end. All right. So let's talk about a little bit about history. Would anyone like to guess who this woman is? I mentioned her earlier in my presentation about the history of asbestos use. Does anybody remember what her name is? It's easier when we're in person because you can either yell it out or look at me like I'm crazy, like you don't remember. I'm not seeing anybody typing in, I'm not seeing hand raised, so I'll tell you who she is. Oh. This is Nellie Kershaw. Remember, she was the one who was employed at the Turner Brothers Asbestos in Manchester in 1917. She was spinning raw asbestos fiber into yarn. And I told you that her death in 1924 led to a formal inquest and that the pathologist, Dr. Cook, who examined her lungs, found pieces of asbestos embedded in them. His work led to the first asbestos regulations and that requiring ventilation in the workspace. These regulations also made asbestosis an excusable work-related disease. And then about 10 years later, the U.S. enacted similar legislation. In 1922, the U.S. Navy identified asbestos work as a hazardous and recommended use of respirators. Even so, do you recall me telling you that in World War II, about 14 out of 1,000 asbestos shipyard workers became ill? In the 1940s, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, which is an association that advances occupation and environmental health, established an exposure limit. And this was a guidance, not a law. It wasn't until 1969 that the U.S. government actually began to leverage change. They leveraged it within the industry by requiring that federal contracts over $10,000 had to adhere to workplace standards. And then in 1971, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, adopted regulations for asbestos, and the EPA listed asbestos a hazardous air pollutant. In 1973, the National Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants 
or NESHAP, many of you may have heard of that, was enacted. It banned spray-on applications, but not did not ban other uses for asbestos. Um, in 1975, it did, the NESHAP did expand to ban many thermal applications. You've got thermal applications and spray-on that are now banned in the 70s. Throughout the 1980s and, or 1970s and 80s, the regulations continue to evolve. This is how it works. You learn something new, you add something new, you, you go back and forth. Adjustments were made on the safe exposure limits, the products, and the labeling. In the 1980s, the EPA also issued regulations pertaining to asbestos in schools. Yeah, in schools. And in 1987, the EPA established the Asbestos Worker Protection Rule which is important to all of you who are government workers. This rule says that government employees must provide their workers with the same protection as OSHA requires of private employers. So remember, those of you who do work for the government, and that includes local government, you're not governed under OSHA. You are governed under the, governed under the Department of Labor. So in 87, they added rules for those of us, me included, work for the, who work for the government. Speeding right along here, in 1989, EPA promulgated the rules to phase out and totally ban the use of asbestos. Finally, we're banning asbestos. However, as James said, in 1991, the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals overturned most of those rules. The prohibition on new uses remained intact. And what this means is asbestos-containing products are still in use in this country today, and you can still buy them off the shelf today. All right, this is important. You'll get this question later on. I want everybody to get 100% on it. Today, in the United States, asbestos is classified and regulated as a hazardous air pollutant when it is airborne and a solid waste when it is disposed of. It is not regulated as a groundwater pollutant because even if it's spilled on the ground or buried in the ground, it does not move through with groundwater to any appreciable extent. It is also not regulated as a hazardous waste. This means when it is disposed of, it can be sent to a solid waste landfill. So remember, asbestos is a hazardous air pollutant when it's in the air. When it is disposed of, it is a solid waste. There are four key areas of regulation that you need to be aware of. First is regulations for your protection. As a worker, you are protected and there are regulations specifically for you. Second, there are regulations on how to remove asbestos from buildings and structures. This is called asbestos abatement in the regulation. There are rules as to who can do it, how they do it, and where it goes. The next one is regulation for the transportation of asbestos. This is includes packaging it, how to package it, how to label it before it can be shipped over the public transportation routes. Um, and then fourth, regulations pertaining on how it must be disposed of when it becomes a waste. Those are very important, different aspects of the life of asbestos and who deals with it and how you deal with it. And we're going to delve into it a little bit. A little bit. So we're not going to go over the regulations in full detail because it's way too much information to go over in this setting. Instead, I want you to leave this workshop knowing that the regulations exist and what they generally cover. You can look them up online if you want to get more details. You can contact us. There, we do have other presentations on asbestos. We're going to start with the first category of regulations, worker protection. There are federal requirements. Again, OSHA covers non-government employees, and EPA worker protection rules covers all of the government employees. At the state level, the New Hampshire Department of Labor implements regulations that apply to all employers. Those regulations basically say, do what OSHA says. So you see here, this is OSHA. These are non-government EPA. This is government. Here's the state of New Hampshire says, do what they say. 
In addition, this department, the Department of Environmental Services through the Air Resources Division where James works, implements a program to license as asbestos abatement contractors and to certify their workers, which includes training and examinations for com competency to do the work safely. So if you do not have one of those licenses, don't attempt to work with asbestos. Do what James said, cover it, cordon it off, move away. Let someone who is qualified to do the work to do it. All right. All of the state and federal rules noted on the prior slide can be summed up with these two statements. If you don't remember anything else, remember this. Employers must train and protect their workers, period. Workers must comply with employer protections. Get it? You need to do what they say. As long as it's in line with the rules. They tell you to do it without a respirator, you walk away. All right. This is a lot of text on this slide. This is a lot. So I'm going to give you a second to take a breath. Breathe it in. The asbestos abatement requirements are important for you to understand because asbestos abatement projects produce waste and that waste could end up at your facility. Remember, asbestos waste is a solid waste. But as we learned right when we started here is the majority of you are prohibited from accepting asbestos waste at your facility. So where does it go? We're gonna talk about it. Remember, the term asbestos abatement refers to the removal of asbestos from a structure. The requirements for asbestos abatement have their roots in NESHAP. Remember, that's the federal regulation that established asbestos to be a hazardous air pollutant when it's airborne, and New Hampshire state law, so RSA 141E, which states Asbestos Management and Control Act. Based on the authority granted in, R in 149E, the DES Air Resources Division adopted rules in ENVA 1800 for conducting asbestos, asbestos abatement. Okay, so the rules require many things. Here's a list of things that are required. The structures to be inspected and surveyed for asbestos before renovation or demolition. If the work will involve asbestos containing materials such as insulation, siding, or roofing, DES must be notified. The work must be done by a licensed contractor using trained and certified workers. The work must occur in a controlled manner so as not to cause a release of asbestos. Typically, air monitoring is required to assure no release. And then when the work is finished, the area, equipment, and workers must systematically be decontaminated. And of course, there is a ton of paperwork and record keeping to document what occurred. These rules are meant to keep the workers safe, the nearby homeowners and businesses owners safe and to protect the, the health and the environment. It is to keep everyone safe and keep the asbestos contained. Now with that said, homeowners, they can do the same work. There is a do-it-yourselfer. They can do their own asbestos abatement work at their home. The rules require them to use the same work practices as licensed contractors and to properly package and dispose of their waste. So meaning they need to do all of these things, meaning decontaminate, air monitor, record keeping, control the work procedures. They're gonna do it themselves. They don't need a contractor or workers, but they need to do all of these things in compliance with the rules. But do they always do that? Frankly, no. So you need to be cautious about what may be in the trash and loads of demolition debris that homeowners deliver to you. And how do you do that? You ask those questions that James talked to you about, including ask them for their um, 
their inspection paperwork that they had at the inspector, inspector come out and check for asbestos. All right, so let's talk about transportation. They have to, everyone has to follow transportation requirements. What are they? The requirements are administered, administered by the U.S. Department of Transportation at the federal level and the New Hampshire Department of Safety at the state level. Haulers do not need a special license to transport asbestos. However, they must follow packaging, labeling, record keeping, and spill reporting requirements. There are, like we said, a lot of paperwork. So what does that include? Transportation requirements. These include packaging it properly. So they need to be an airtight, puncture resistant, bulk and non-bulk. There are bulk and non-bulk methods for packaging it. The placard vehicle, vehicles need to be placard, placarded. They need to have a placard on them. And each container needs to be labeled. The shipping papers, you're going to use a bill of lading, not a hazardous waste manifest. Now here. It needs to be delivered to a permitted facility only. Now, this permitted facility, you need to notice, you need to send notice to them prior to you just showing up at their gate. And the reason is because think about this: if you are taking it to, say, a landfill for disposal, that landfill needs to prep an area in the landfill that they can put that waste in and then immediately cover it back up. They need to be ready for you to get there. You must also report spills. So I don't have a ton of experience with asbestos. I am still learning all of this as I'm going, but I will tell you about one um, thing that happened that I took care of a call that came in at a landfill. So there was a landfill in the North Country. Um, the gate operator called me at, it was like 2.30, the Friday before 4th of July. I think 4th of July was on a Sunday. So it was like everybody was ready to go. Truck shows up um, that was full of asbestos waste and they made it all the way. They, they, the guy took the paperwork, had everything right, and they made it all the way to the face of the landfill. The, op the truck driver got out of the truck and they opened the doors to the truck and the operator who was monitoring the, where they were going to place the waste, immediately stopped the truck driver from dumping that asbestos waste into the hull. He noticed that there was unpackaged waste, there were holes in the plastic, there was, nothing was placarded correctly. It quite frankly was a disaster. So he immediately told the truck driver, you need to close those doors right away go back down to the um, the front gate. So the guy in the scale house, the front gate, he calls DES. He's like, what do I do? I need to change the shipping paperwork to note that we're not accepting this. And how do I determine what to write? And I'm like, why did you call me? <laughs> why why me? And, and so I didn't know what to tell him. I said, don't do anything. I will be right back. I will call you back in 10 minutes. So I went and talked with the supervisors and the permanent engineer. They happened to be in the same in the same room. They're having a meeting. And both of them looked at me like, what? They said, this has nothing to do with paperwork at this time. That truck cannot go back on the road. That truck needs to be completely repackaged. We could have had a disaster on our hands um, with asbestos going back and forth and back and forth up and down the road uh, when it needed to be prepackaged and stay where it was. So thank God they called us. Second, thank goodness I had the right people to talk to. And third, that asbestos abatement contractor, long story short, lost their license because they didn't know what they were doing. And they were they were ending up, ended up harming others in the long run. So if you don't know what you're doing, or if something comes to your facility that looks suspicious, you need to not accept it and hold that vehicle there because they cannot go back on the road legally. And if they try to fight back with you, you call the police and then you call DES. It, don't risk your safety and your, your health for someone else not doing something correct. All right, let's go forward a little bit. So asbestos disposal regulations. Aha, we're finally talking about solid waste now. 
So transporters of asbestos must deliver it to a properly permitted solid waste transfer or disposal facility. As you know from basic training, in New Hampshire, solid waste facilities are regulated by RSA 149M, which is the, solid, the State Solid Waste Management Act, and the solid waste rules, which are codified under subtitle ENVSW. The rules for handling asbestos waste are in New Hampshire, Asbestos waste in New Hampshire are in ENV SW901. A copy of those rules are in the handouts for you, so you can look, those, look at those at your leisure. The disposal requirements are also found in NESHEP, which again is the National Emission Standard for Hazardous Air Pollutants, which identified asbestos as a hazardous air pollutant. The rules in 901 include specific requirements for collection, storage, and transfer, process and treatment, transportation, packaging and labeling, and disposal. Theirs are all in the 901 rules. Asbestos waste must be landfilled. You cannot send it to an incinerator or a waste to energy facility. It doesn't burn, why would you send it there? Likewise, you cannot send it to a compost facility. Again, it doesn't biodegrade, it must be landfilled. In New Hampshire, this is the question that was asked earlier. In New Hampshire, there are three landfills permitted to accept asbestos. You've got Turnkey in Rochester, Mount Carberry in Success Township, and Nashua. The facility in Nashua can only accept it from Nashua properties. It has to be, the, the asbestos has to be generated in Nashua. Again, the facility must be notified ahead of time so it can prepare a trench and have proper cover materials available. It also needs to have, it needs to provide their workers with proper protection for when that asbestos waste does come to that portion of the facility. Currently, there are no municipally owned transfer stations in New Hampshire accepting asbestos waste because it must be included in their solid waste permit and there aren't any who are accepting it. So, those of you who are asking, well, I don't know if I can accept it or not, and you work at a town transfer station, you can't accept it. However, in 2014, and it was seven years ago, we amended the New Hampshire solid waste rules to make it easier for licensed asbestos abatement contractors to get a permit to store up to 100 cubic yards of asbestos waste produced from their contract, contracted work. This allows them to consolidate their waste into full loads before it must be delivered to a landfill thus making it more cost effective. This also provides them with the opportunity if they wish to offer their services to homeowners who have small quantities of asbestos waste to dispose of from work they did themselves. Remember, homeowners can, can do it yourself with asbestos and, and doing their, their um, abatement. The contractor can pick up the waste from the homeowner at their curb and transport it properly packaged and labeled back to their contractors permitted storage area to eventually be hauled to a landfill with other waste generated by that contractor. These asbestos abatement contractor holding facilities are not for citizen drop off. Only the contractor can access the facility. Can you imagine your residents rolling up to a contractor's facility with a bag full of asbestos and saying, here you go, it's properly packaged. Yeah, no, that is not the way it works. Now, for those of you who work at a municipal transfer station that receives an unexpected gift of asbestos from a homeowner, you know you do. You can contact one of these permitted holding facilities and have that contractor come and get the waste. Granted, it will be for a fee. They will charge you to come pick that up. All right, so with that, I know that's a lot of information to give you guys. Does anyone have any questions? I do see that there are a couple. I gotta pull this screen out so I can answer those. Hold on one second. All right. Oh, well, we have lots of questions. Okay. So the question is to which facilities do accept asbestos containing material? So those, those three facilities, you've got the Nashville landfill, you've got Rochester, and then the ABVRD. Um, and then for those of you who run municipal transfer stations, there are a few of those asbestos abatement contractors that do have a permit by notification to hold 
asbestos at their facility, you can work with them as well. Um, all right, so I will ask that question. All right, so I have a question that I actually don't know the answer to. Um, if they haul asbestos, if, if and James, I don't know if you'll know this one either. Um, if a uh, if someone is hauling asbestos, do they have to register as a solid waste hauler? No. Um, basically, uh, there is no restriction on who can transport it, mm -hmm. as far as I know. Um, but if you do transport it, you are subject to uh, U.S. Department of Transportation regulations that require it to be packaged properly and labeled properly. Okay. Um, so, uh, regular residents can, uh, transport it. Um, however, uh, there is a notification requirement, uh, in the asbestos rules that require notification to DES prior to transport and disposal. Um, I think it probably is a gray area if it's just being transported, okay. um, and not disposed of. Okay. Um, and then there's this other question. This is probably one for you as well. Um, do I think there's a spelling mistake here? Um, do asbestos utilities count as a remediation project? Yes. Yes. So okay. um, under the asbestos rules. Uh, the the um, the things that are are regulated is called a facility, and those include utility infrastructure. So anything that provides a service uh, like electricity or uh, drinking water or wastewater, those are subject to uh, asbestos related requirements. There okay. can be on older electrical lines asbestos containing insulation. Okay. The reason the reason that that question was asked is because some of these the the attendees they also work for DPW as well as the solid waste facility so they may interact with utilities um, in their towns. Okay. All right. Does anybody else have any questions for me before I hand it over to James? I am not seeing anything else. All right, James, I'm going to share, pass the baton to you. There you go. And we see your slides. All right, great. Uh, so Thank I you. just have a, a couple more slides. Uh, and, and a lot of this is just um, rehashing old stuff that we've already talked about. Uh, and it, it goes into the best management practice for uh, asbestos material. If, if you come across uncontained asbestos waste at your facility, uh, the solid waste operator should not disturb the asbestos waste. Again, uh, the only people that should be disturbing that waste are trained uh, professionals. Secure it with a tarp or uh, polyethylene uh, sheeting and wet if necessary. Uh, the solid waste rules require uh, that if it's friable material that you wet it uh, before you uh, cover it. Tape or put up barricades around the waste and post warning signs to let other people know that this is asbestos containing waste. And follow your solid waste facility operator operating plan for proper removal and disposal. Uh, I, I don't know much about facility operating plans uh, because that's more of the solid waste side, but it's my understand that my understanding that a description of what you should do uh, if you encounter this situation should be included in your plan. And then uh, I just want to go through what if you uh, come across a situation where you have contained asbestos waste 
which is a lot simpler. It's already uh, contained and it's relatively safe as long as uh, that container doesn't break. Um, and basically, it's either going to be in bags or in a lined container. Uh, and that container should be lined with uh, uh, polyethylene sheeting. And uh, it needs to be the equivalent of 20 mils of that polyethylene sheeting. Uh, it can be one 20 mil lining or two 10, uh, 10 sheets, 10 mil thick. Uh, so if it's contained, the uh, operator should move it to a secure location. It's, it's okay to move once it's contained. Uh, and then also put up tape or barricade around with, with warning signs. And again, uh, there should be a description in your plan for proper removal and disposal of the waste. Um, often, uh, what I tell homeowners, uh, I, I get many calls a week uh, from homeowners of what they're supposed to do with their asbestos waste. Uh, Mount Carberry and uh, uh, turnkey in Rochester will not allow a resident to just show up in their vehicle to dispose of asbestos waste. Uh, in Nashua, uh, I'm not sure what their what their requirements are. Uh, so what I've been telling people is contact uh, an asbestos abatement contractor to come and dispose of that waste on your behalf. And so that's it for my slides. Does anyone have any questions? I am not seeing any hands raised, but I'm going to throw out a poll question. Because now everybody should know what is asbestos. Please choose the best answers. So James, the answers, since you can't see it, the answers are a solid waste, a hazardous waste, a hazardous air pollutant. I'll give you guys a few more seconds. All right. So what we got is 85% said a solid waste, 23% said a hazardous waste, but 100% said a hazardous air pollutant. You are correct. 100% is a, is a hazardous air pollutant, but it also is a solid waste. Asbestos is never a hazardous waste according to the definitions of hazardous waste. So, oh, I got a question, James. Where's my question pane? Uh-oh, my question pane disappeared. Bear with me. Ah, here we go. Is there bags that we can get for the state if someone does come in? Oh, James? Uh, the state does not provide bags. Uh, however, you can go to like a Home Depot or a Lowe's and get six mil bags uh, that are six mil thick. Uh, what you should use are, are two of those. Um, what I've done personally, um, when I am not doing asbestos abatement, you're essentially just removing non-friable asbestos containing material and, and not really touching it. In this case, for me, it was on window glazing. I took out the whole window. Um, and put, uh, I wetted it down just as a precaution and then put each window uh, in a six mil bag and then contact an abatement contractor to come pick it up. Now, James, that the bag itself does not need to say asbestos on it, but you do need to label it with the words asbestos, correct? Yes, you do need to label it correctly. In, in my case, the abatement contractor did that for me. Um, I think you can go online uh, and, and order these bags that, that already say what is required by the Department of Transportation. Um, 
uh, so you can can do that, but they do cost uh, quite a bit more than your regular Home Depot uh, six mil bags. Right. I was gonna say if you're gonna have a just in case, if you want to have bags on hand just in case, then you can go to Home Depot buy them and then have you can print out something on paper that says asbestos and has all the information you need, and then package and tape it onto those those packages. The bag itself does not need to have the words asbestos containing materials on it. So if you're on a budget, but you want to make sure that you're following the rules, that will work. Yeah, you could get a Home Depot bag. And then uh, what I've done is just gone, Googled US DOT uh, label, asbestos label, and mm -hmm. one will come up and you can print it and, and then tape it on the bag. Perfect. Uh, w one of the items that, that should be on the bag is the, the generator address. So wherever that, that asbestos material is coming from, um, that is uh, kind of the last thing at the bottom that should be mm -hmm. filled in yes. on the label. That's, that's very important too for um, those of you who are in the Nashua area to put Nashville on there because then the Nashville landfill can take it. And if, it, if there's an asbestos contractor that's picking up from you and that asbestos contractor is planning to take it to the Nashville landfill, you need to make sure that the address that is on your bag is a Nashville address. All right, so let's see, do we have any more questions for asbestos? I am not seeing any. So James, I'm going to take the control back from you and I have a very I have a very short presentation to go over with you guys on solid waste operator training. It is just a reminder because we are getting um some questions and then also some um a lot of it missing information from the the uh the um applications themselves so i will go ahead and go through that and then leave you guys to your day um, if you have more asbestos questions feel free to throw them in or if you've got um solid waste operator training questions feel free to add those in as well so we're just going to talk really quickly about renewing your solid waste operator certification you know that to maintain your certification you need to submit a renewal application no more than 90 days before your certification expires as a courtesy, we are sending a pre-populated renewal address to your home address or renewal application to your home address about two to three months before your certification expires. If you move or your address changes or has to be changed, let us know. If you have chosen to use your facility's address as your mailing address and you change facilities, you need to let us know so that we can then send it to you and not to your old facility that you're working for because they may just throw it away. Even if you don't receive this pre-populated renewal application from us, you must still fill one out and submit it to us. You can find the renewal applications on our website, or you can call me and I will point you in the direction of where it is on the website. You must also ensure that the renewal application includes your $50 fee and proof, proof that you attended two and a half hours of continuing professional development. So you may be asking yourself, well, what is continuing professional development exactly? You may not remember from basic. Continuing professional is any training that provides information and instruction relevant to waste management and solid waste facility operations. All certified solid waste operators must take at least two and a half hours each year, and the training must be completed in the 12 months between your expiration dates. You may report, repeat courses or trainings, but they won't count towards your certification renewal or step increases. Now, I know we've been in COVID for the last forever, <laughs> 18 months or so. So thing, expiration dates and things have gotten a little bit wishy-washy, um, not wishy-washy. We were given an extension um, through an executive order. That, ex that extension has expired. However, those of you that were still falling under it during that time still have your extra time. But what has happened is if you wait that long, you then need to renew within three months. So you're still on that rolling renewal and your expiration date does not change. I'm putting that out there because we're getting a lot of people who are confused. All right. On the website, 
there is a list of workshops that you can attend. Uh, the schedule is subject to change and workshops will be added as the year goes on. The good thing about COVID is that we actually are recording sessions now. So they are on demand. Right now, I think there's 20 um, sessions online that are on demand that you can watch at any time, including this session will be up online as soon as we're done with it today. Uh, workshops put on by DES count as continuing professional development. There are also third-party training opportunities listed on the website as well. If you'd like to tra take training that's not listed on our website, that's fine. Um, you should probably contact me, let me know what you're taking so I can check to make sure it will count 90% of the time, it's gonna count. Um, one piece of advice that we give is don't wait until the last minute to take your training. It's amazing how time seems to get away from us and you don't wanna get stuck trying to find a training before your certification expires. Uh, COVID gave us a, a good example for that. Also to avoid repeating classes, use this table to track the, the classes that you've taken. This is your record. You don't have to submit it to DES and it is not proof of workshops. This is for you to keep track of your records. Everyone should have this in their basic training manual. If you don't have it, they're, they are online as well. Or if it's full, they're online. This is what your certificate looks like. You should know what your certificate looks like. It belongs to you, not your employer. Even if your employer has paid the fee, the certification still belongs to you. We mail the certificate to the home address you gave us on your application. Again, if you've moved, let us know. Um, when you receive your certificate, bring it to the facility where you work and post it in a visible place. So wherever you're, you work, you should be checking to make sure that you're up to date on your certificate. It should not have an expiration expired date on it. According to the solid waste rules, you are required to have your certificate posted. A copy is fine. If you wanna keep your um, original at home, that's fine. And you will get a new certificate every year when you renew. Now, I have tried to drill this into everyone's head. It's your certificate, not your employer's. So it is your responsibility to make sure you're up to date. All right, as a certified operator, you are able to advance your steps. Everyone starts at a zero, step zero. As you complete trainings and accumulate professional development, you'll advance your steps. So let's say you wanna be a step four, then you need a total hours of 37 and a half, not each year, but total over the course of your tenure as a solid waste operator. If DES receives your renewal application within 90 days after your certification date, you must include a $75 fee. That is a standard fee plus the late fee. Late fees were reinstated when the executive order lifted. And then you must still submit your proof of continuing professional development as well. If DES receives your renewal package more than 90 days after your certification expiration date, you have to start over by coming back to basic and taking the test. No fun. All right, does anyone have any questions about solid waste operator training, renewing, about asbestos, um, or how you're gonna show proof of training for today? For today, those of you who registered under your own name, you do not have to have a certificate. I will look it up to see how long you were logged in, make sure that you're good to go. For those of you who are in attendance with someone else, you guys need to create a sign-in sheet, verification of training. Um, you can include your notes of what you took on the class. Um, and those of you who are watching the recording, you, we will set it up so that you can get a certificate after you watch it for those of you who actually are the one registered. If you're watching in a group, again, you're going to need to create your own verification of training, which include, can include your notes, the date you attended the class, the time in, the time out, the title of the class. If you have questions about that or really just want to talk to me or if you have a better idea of how to run it, let me know. I will take those. All right. With that, this is the end of your day today. You will get two and a half hours of training for today. Um, does anyone have any questions before we go? Not seeing any. And I would like to very much thank James for uh, training today. I know he is quite busy. Uh, and I'm hoping that this will take some of that busyness away from you. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.